Okay, so to kick things off, um, I'm, I'm really delighted to invite to the stage a personal friend and one of the true visionaries of our industry. Um, and he's going to share his high-level vision. Let's see what I've done there. So clever. Um, so please welcome to the stage Rovio's mighty eagle himself, Peter Vesterbacker. Yeah, hey, thanks, Chris. So it's really great to be here. It's been like many years since I was in India last time, and things have definitely changed. So uh, everybody has a smartphone, or actually not everybody yet, but I mean, there's more than 100 million, and somebody told me that there's going to be 100 million more this year. So it's, uh, you know, always a good number. But hey, one thing, uh, what I wanted to do actually, which is like uh, a little bit like in the spirit of this event, uh, share actually a video that uh, uh, we created uh, or actually launched like last week. So if you could come like play that video and I'll explain like why I want to show it after that. When I was young I never needed anyone Making love was just Those days are gone Living alone I think of all the friends I know When I dial the telephone Nobody's home sales pitch but yeah of course you can download and like play the party <laughs> mode <laughs> that's like fine uh, 130 million uh, downloads for Angry Birds Go already so uh, I think uh, Oscar from our Stockholm studio tweeted that it's bigger than all the Mario games combined since 1992 so it's not too bad for a yeah for a game that's been out uh, roughly a year so uh, you know it's a good start but what the reason why I want to show this is that uh, we're not alone and, and uh, I mean, this uh, event is a great example of that, that we have like a few hundred people here in this room. But uh, it used to be a pretty lonely business, because if you go back to kind of like uh, 2003, when Rovio got started, and that's also, you know, around the time, or actually maybe a couple of years before when I met uh, Ilkka, uh, that you, a lot of you guys know, who runs Supercell nowadays, and he had just started uh, uh, Sumea, uh, so this little game studio with two of his friends. In, in Helsinki, and, and in 2003, it was pretty lonely business, and, and you know, when you told people that, oh, we're making mobile games, it was like, uh, right, uh, you know, like, what is that? Because that was when you had, you know, the first phones with, like, the uh, Java on them, and black and white screens, and yeah, you know, you had Snake and stuff. So uh, it wasn't kind of like a massively popular business, and, and uh, the world has, has definitely changed. But uh, I, I think that it's, it's really great to see that and, and kind of like having been around when, you know, it was still, you know, like cool that you could demo that, hey, check this out, I can send a message to you, you know, like, and, you know, stuff like that. Or, or, you know, like when the first ringtones and that ringtone started, uh, started, I, I was actually, that was like before Rovia, I was working for HP and I remember when I uh, uh, was pitching that to an operator in Austria, and I was told that, yeah, you know, like this might be like a big thing in Finland, but it's never going to work in Austria. And then I said, okay, fine. You know, I'll just give you the servers and everything, you know, and you can kind of like test this. And this was just before Christmas uh, that year, I remember. It must have been like 99, uh, 2000, like super early days anyway. And so we gave them the servers, we gave them everything to kind of like get into the ringtone business, and we said, okay, like we'll give you this for free, but we'll, you know, share, we'll take half. 
and uh, it paid for itself because I was like over Christmas in like 20 days or something. So it was like a pretty good deal for, for HP at the time. And yeah, it turned out that ringtones were, you know, kind of like a pretty good business, or worth a few billion then over the time. But yeah, anyway, so uh, if you now look at our business, I mean, we're definitely not alone, and, and uh, there's quite a few people making games, and I think what is really good about events like this is that uh, it's great to get together, you know, share experiences, and look at where we're at. And on the Rovio side, we've always been happy to share kind of like what we're up to, and, and you know, uh, if, you, if you want to know something, you know, just ask. Uh, no problem, and I think that's what's great about this uh, community as well, that uh, it's, uh, it's very, very open, very collaborative. Uh, but then, uh, you know, okay, this high-level view, so, um, uh, okay, I already mentioned that there's going to be a few more smartphones here in India this year, and okay, 100 million this year is, is uh, you know, it's pretty good, but uh, if you look at China, 100 million smartphones every quarter, you want. That's pretty big. But uh, to put things in perspective, uh, you know, if you then look at the global picture, there are like lots of interesting stats. Uh, just the Apple App Store is bigger than the Hollywood box office. You know, all Hollywood movies combined. And that's just Apple. I'm sure you heard about Google Play, that's pretty big as well. So uh, our industry is not uh, exactly like a tiny one anymore. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've grown up. Uh, then another very interesting kind of like piece of uh, statistic that I, I personally love, talking to the music industry and all of these guys, that the biggest song of uh, 2013 made as much money in two years as the biggest mobile game does in five days. Or four days, it's like, you know, <laughs> up for debate. So that also puts things in perspective that, yeah, I mean, the music industry is pretty big and, you know, like uh, people listen to music and you ha we have the Spotify's and iTunes and like all of those guys. But uh, again, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting, but two years versus like five days, it really kind of puts things in, in, uh, in perspective. So uh, our business is not tiny. Okay, then uh, if you look at uh, some of the things that we've done with Angry Birds, so, uh, of course, uh, at Rovio, uh, we are making games, and I mean, we're releasing more games this year than last year, and, uh, you know, we're uh, doing pretty well in that. Uh, we had 600 million downloads for Angry Birds games last year, and uh, our total now for Angry Birds is 2.8 billion. So, uh, you know, we're getting there, but there are, of course, 7 billion people on the planet, so we're kind of like far from where we need to be. But not all of them have smartphones yet, so you know we kind of like need to kind of like wait for that to happen. But uh, I think that it's it's also uh, uh, an interesting example of the kind of like the reach, the scale. Okay, I mentioned you know like Angry Birds Go that you saw there in the video, 130 million, more than all Mario games uh, like in the history of Mario, uh, you know, combined. Uh, and uh, you know it's just not you know like okay to brag that, okay, we have more than anybody else. But, but what is very interesting is that you can now do these kind of things. You can reach this kind of scale. So uh, it's a little bit that, you know, if we can do it, you can do it. And I mean, now with India, we have, you know, Indonesia, of course, China already, like, huge. So the market is getting bigger and bigger. But it doesn't mean that it's getting any easier. So uh, one other interesting thing. Uh, it took something like nine years to reach 700 titles on Nintendo, you know, across all the like Nintendo, various devices, the Wii's and uh, uh, NES's and DS's and all of that. So it took uh, took a while, uh, you know, uh, nine years to 700 titles. Uh, then, of course, if you know the stats on the App Store side, it takes something like seven two hours to, you know, add another 900 titles on the game side. So it's like a bit crowded. So for every Angry Birds, there are many not so angry birds, not so successful games. Many of those games are actually super good, but uh, the problem is that nobody knows about them. And, you know, being a marketing guy, uh, always uh, telling everybody that if you're serious about making games, you need to be pretty serious about your marketing as well. So it's not good enough to just make great games. But I mean, this is, you know, true in any industry that, you know, like, uh, it's not good enough to make a great movie. You have to have great marketing to go along as well. And it's super, super important. And uh, 
If you look at what we're doing at Rovio and what we've done with Angry Birds, I mean, this is now our sixth year of Angry Birds. Angry Birds came out uh, 11th of December 2009, so a while ago. And uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, again, it's a uh, very short time, you know, six years, if you look at kind of like the lifetime of a brand. I mean, our friends at Sanrio, they've been doing uh, Hello Kitty for like 40 years or this year's like 31st. And uh, Mario has been around for almost 30 years. And then, uh, you know, Disney, there's that mouse character that we all know, 1928, and Mickey Mouse still going strong. So Angry Birds is really kind of just a baby when it comes to like brand. But because of digital distribution, you know, the massive amounts of uh, smartphones and tablets and all of that, you can, bring, you can build brand, you can build awareness much, much faster. So uh, what we've done in six years is, uh, uh, is that we built a brand that is now known by pretty much nine out of 10 people on the planet. 93% of the Chinese population, 91% here in India, nine out of 10 Americans know the brand. So uh, quite a few people know the brand. And that's also, if you look at uh, the numbers I mentioned on the download side, 600 million downloads of our games last year without any paid user acquisition. So it's all part of the brand. So uh, I think that's uh, also like, pretty interesting. And, uh, and we really believe that where our industry is going, and, it, and this is, you know, again, for any, any market, any develop market, if you look at movies, look at anything in entertainment, uh, you know, these things called brands matter. Super, super important. And if you don't have a brand, yeah, then you might have to spend hundreds of millions on advertising, TV, outdoor, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a very different approach uh, to building brand than, than, let's say, some of the other players. So, so, uh, We've always been very proud at Rovia doing things differently. So again, like in this room, it's pretty easy to spot who works for Rovia. You know, so it's me and those two guys there, Antti and Anurag. So we, we, we like doing things that stand out, but it's all about the brand. And you know, when we release a new game, people know the brand, they'll download it. Maybe you know, like you don't like it and you don't keep the game, but at least you know, we get we get there. So that's something that's uh, very, very important to kind of like stand out in the crowd of all of those other titles, as I mentioned, you know, the 900 or so that hit the App Store every, every 72 hours. Uh, then uh, we don't view ourselves as a games company. Uh, of course, we're very proud of the games that we're doing, and that's kind of like at the core of our business. But we also uh, use the brand to launch into consumer products. So uh, uh, been doing uh, pretty well on that side. So we have tens of thousands of Angry Birds branded products out there. You know, so the hoodies and you know, the iPad covers and you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, lot of stuff. Uh, of course the toys, tens of millions of uh, Angry Birds plush toys. So uh, things you can do when you have a brand. And uh, yeah, we're also, uh, you know, on the consumer products, or let's say the physical product side, also building parks. So we have now uh, Angry Birds activity parks on most continents, super popular. So they're not like theme parks, you know, big uh, things like Disneyland, uh, not these like once in a lifetime experiences, but we really want to build uh, experiences that are lifestyle. So you can go to our parks, I mean, if not every day, uh, they're in your neighborhood, uh, you can go there like every week. And it's always a great experience. And you don't stand in line for two hours. You actually go there and you're part of the activity like immediately. So again, doing things differently from some of the other guys out there. And there's the movie. So next year, 20th of May, the Angry Birds movie is coming out. And uh, that's something that we're also, of course, super excited about. Um, but it's just a movie. So it's one part, one piece of... Uh, building uh, this global brand. And the way we look at Angry Birds, the brand, we're not building the brand like some games are built for like 100 days and then you do the next. We're building Angry Birds for 100 years. 
you know, to start with. Then we'll look at like the next 100 years. But taking a very, very long-term view, everything we do, games, our animations, you know, so not just the movies, our animated shorts, Toons TV that we have in all of our games. We have now uh, over 5 billion views in, uh, in um, about uh, two years. So uh, again, reaching a lot of people with our brand, with our content. And yeah, next year is the first movie, and then we'll see when, when, we, get, when we do the next one. But it's, it's a very important part of building, building the brand. So uh, when you look at Rovia and look at Angry Birds today, uh, we're really in the business of bi building uh, Angry Birds branded experiences in all forms and shapes for our fans. So our business is actually super simple. It's all about you know, fans and brand. And then we kind of keep those two things in mind, and, and uh, when we do that, hopefully we, we then kind of like, uh, you know, know what we're doing and, and uh, create, uh, create great experience for our fans and, and uh, make some money as well. But uh, as we are in the business of interactive entertainment, I thought I'll, you know, like open up for questions because, uh, you know, Chris and those who know me know that I can stand up here and talk for like hours and hours, and I'm not going to bore you with, with that. So uh, I'm sure you have some, uh, some questions and comments, so, you know, shoot. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we've got a roaming mic. So before, while that's going around, I'm going to ask you one quick question myself. Um, so obviously, you've built a pretty good brand. Yeah, it's a good start. As <laughs> it's, well, you've so got yeah. 9 out of 10 people now. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad yeah. stuff. No. People starting out don't have the benefit of you know, uh, several billion installs. So what, what, is, what would be your... You're very good at brand. I know you've worked in other companies and other events. and you've, you're very. What would be your top tips for developers... And publishers starting out, you know, in terms of building a brand, their own brand. What would you suggest? Yeah, I think I think that it's it's like in any market, and and I think it's it's particularly true in games uh, today. But uh, it's it's kind of like anywhere you go, that it's not like there's a shortage of games or shortage of products, shortage of services. And and when you have that, uh, I think it's super important that you stand out. You know, like at every level, so that uh, you know, why should I download this game? over this other game. And I think that then you really have to think about like, how, why is it uh, you know, different? How does it stand out? Maybe you know, it's a red icon, you know, red bird or something like that, so that it kind of like jumps at you and you immediately recognize that. So really thinking about like, how do you stand out? And then I think one, one thing that is also uh, very, very important, uh, you know, and, and this is not just for brand, but in any, anything you do, that you, then, you really have to kind of like, you have to live the brand, you have to believe in what you do. And actually, this is one, one thing that uh, I always like to ask a question from you guys. So uh, who here, uh, you know, now being here in India, and there's like lots of talent, lots of games being made here. So uh, just a question to, you know, you guys making games. So who here can build the next Angry Birds? Hands up, come on. Yeah, come on. There you go. That's Excellent. The yeah. Excellent. But, but this is the thing, this is the thing, I always ask this, and then, you know, like, hey, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, why don't I see all hands going up? Are you, like, even serious about making games? Of course, you know, you have to believe that you'll make the next Angry Birds. Okay, so, oh. so yeah, okay, okay. So, uh, so what, what, then, uh, okay, so let me, let me, let me rephrase the question. So then, so who is going to make the next um, uh, Candy Crush? <laughs> so if that's like more your cup of tea, but I was, uh, you know, still talking like, uh, yeah, anyway, let's not even go there. <laughs> But if you are into like Match 3, I mean, that's fine as well. We're also coming out with some amazing Match 3 games, like Angry Birds Fight, Real Time, Match 3 Battle Game coming out right real soon. Yeah, anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> where's the sales thing? So, no, no, so but, but, it's, but, it's, but it's super important. I mean, that, this is something that, you know, again, that there is kind of like no reason. You really have to take that kind of approach. You have to have that ambition. I mean, nobody believed me when I said, okay, we're going to have 100 million dollars for Angry Birds. That's when we had like two or three million, which was also like a good start. Nobody believed me because that was something that hadn't been done before. Yeah. 
Now, you know, like uh, there's lots of people that owe 100 million, 200, so on, you know, and people who have more than a billion dollars. So it's not like unheard of. But at that time, I was told that, oh, you know, Tetris is the only game that's ever gotten to 100 million copies. It took them 20 years. No way you're going to get 100 million dollars for Angry Birds. EA told me that, Sing, you know, all of those guys. And, uh, and I think th this is really important that you have to believe that, you know, you're going to build the next one. And OK, you don't have to build the next Angry Birds, I'm fine with that, but you know. Cool. Yeah. All right, that's a really good question. So what other questions have we got? We've got certainly time for a couple of questions. Chat there with a check shirt. Thank you very much. Uh, on the flight, Andy told me, uh, the gentleman over here, mm -hmm. he told me that, for example, you can also be the giants on whose shoulder other developers can stand on. Mm -hmm. So, which means you also co-produce. So, for example, if there are yes. other developers who can pitch across to you, mm -hmm. and Rovio will take the trouble of taking it to the market, get the muscle behind, and uh, yeah. So, so, so one one thing uh, that's actually a very important point. So, uh, we don't uh, make all the games, animations, all the products, obviously ourselves. So, we work with partners, and we always had uh, this approach: we want to be the best possible partner. Know, for our partners, whoever they might be. It's very, very important. Uh, and I mean, also to going back to the video that I showed, that it's, it's really about doing stuff together. And a uh, great example of that, uh, we're about to launch Angry Birds Fight. It's our first game that we made in Japan, you know, for Japan and the world. And uh, we've been working with a company called Kiteretsu on that one. And uh, I, I think that it's, it's very, very important. I mean, obviously, I'm not Japanese, I'm not Indian, so uh, what do I know? Uh, so we need to work with local people who kind of like understand the market. And it was very interesting. I was in Tokyo last week, and uh, we had Pekka and our CEOs on, on stage, and then uh, Tanaka-san, who is the founder of GRI. And it was very interesting, kind of like different in perspective. So, Tanaka-san was saying that, okay, they don't think that they can, you know, like make games in Japan and take them to the world. They much rather go to, you know, the U.S. buy a studio, make the games there. Uh, while our approach was that uh, we really, really believe that we can work with the studios in Japan, like we're working with Kiteretsu, make great games for Japan, but then also leveraging the brand of Angry Birds and like our experience, our global presence uh, to take that to the world. And I think, you know, like if you look at now India, Lots of great talent, obviously, and uh, you know we are always very, very open to work with local developers, you know, on Angry Birds games or you know totally different games. And we also have our Rovio Stars program where we publish games like Juice Cubes, Plunder Pirates, uh, Jolly Jam, and and so on. So we're publishing a handful of games like every year, and again uh, leveraging kind of our reach, our presence. Uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, very, very happy to, to talk about that. And uh, I think that it kind of goes very well with the theme here that, you know, good to bring people together and, and work on, on these things, not alone, but, but, but together. So yeah. So we'll do one question. One just thought for me to throw out there. Angry Birds, Red Bull, I don't know. Has anybody got a thought there? It's a relatively popular sport in this country. Throw it out there. <laughs> If I don't see Angry Birds cricket in a couple of years, I'll be very upset. Yeah, somebody, <laughs> somebody told me that this like, cricket thing is apparently like, pretty big here in India. Got one more question, yeah. young lady there. Uh, hi, I'm Anila from 99 Games. I had a quick question for you. Uh, Angry Birds has been there as a game for a very long time, and we just wanted to know, when did you stop looking at Angry Birds as a game, but started looking at it as a brand? Uh, I think that... Uh, Again, if you look at Rovio, uh, so Rovio got started uh, in 2003, and then, okay, we made 51 games before Angry Birds, so we uh, kind of like learned the hard way, you know, that, okay, it's not so much fun making games for others, so we, we you know, tried that and worked for hire, you know, not so much fun. Uh, not a good business, definitely, so almost killed the company. But, uh, but I think that also, so, so because of that background, uh, working with, uh, you know, big IP owners, and, and making games for them, so you kind of like start to understand where you want to be. So, so uh, it, it really, uh, uh, I think that's, that's kind of like important to know that we're kind of like coming from that experience and looking at uh, where do we want to be when we grow up. 
And, uh, and then if you look at also the history of Angry Birds, I mean, how the game got started. So Jaska or Jaakko is also one of our game designers. Uh, he was uh, pitching this kind of like new game idea and uh, nobody really got like the game and the mechanic and you know, like all of that, but everybody fell in love with the characters. You know, so, and the, the kind of like the outcome there was that, oh, we have to build a game around those birds. So the game got started not with kind of like the kind of like prototype of a game, play mechanic or something like that, but it really started with the characters. And then we built the game around that. So we started with the birds, then you know, the pigs happened, the slingshot was added very late. So I think that it's um, a little bit also on uh, how kind of like the whole game got started, that it was about the characters. And that's why I always you know, mention Hello Kitty, Mickey Mouse, Mario, all you know, great examples of character-driven brands, character-driven franchises. So, so uh, you know, to answer your question, I think that we started thinking about brand, thinking about characters super early. Uh, but then also, uh, uh, I think that uh, you can't plan these things that, okay, you know, you, we, we start by saying that, okay, let's make a game and then, you know, we'll build these parks and we'll do all of these things. And I still remember when people asked uh, me that, okay, that, you know, like, uh, how many Angry Birds theme parks will there be? And it's like, uh, uh, not really, you know, like, thinking about that. You know, and, and then uh, uh, the same thing with like toys and like all the consumer products, that there was something that uh, we kind of like got into that and then uh, we saw like massive traction in the toys sold out immediately and then we kind of like realized that, hey, we're onto something here. So, so I think that that's also part of this that uh, you can't have, uh, and, I th and I'm not like a big believer in like planning everything kind of like carefully, you really have to, um, you have to be very like agile and, and you have to be very uh, good at um, reacting to, to the outside world. So, so uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's one of these things that uh, can't plan everything and, and just kind of like go with the flow a little bit. And, and I think that we've been kind of like reasonably good at, at, at doing that on, on the Rovio side. But we're, you know, every day we're, we're uh, learning new things. So. Cool. All yeah. right. That's fantastic. Can we just do a quick, we're doing selfies. Can we round of applause, please, for Peter? <laughs> fantastic. Hey, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Vestabaka. Um, so, we've got uh, a representative of another mobile games legend up next, uh, who I'm really proud to watch grow from a, a small two-man indie studio into another kind of globally recognised brand. So, to share the secrets of their success, uh, please welcome Zepto Labs' Misha Lelayon. Is that right, Lelayon? Yes. You're right there. Hey. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> uh, clicker. Sorry. Right. I'm sorry. Is there a clicker? Clicker. Yeah. A clicker. Clicker's coming. You got a clicker? Okay. Thank you. There we go. Oh, sorry, too far. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, today um, about the story of our company and, and why I think it's relevant is because uh, there are very many indie developers in the studio, uh, in, the, in the audience here. Zeptolab really started um, as an indie company, really. I mean, we're two brothers. We're making games in their apartment, uh, like it's supposed to be. And uh, the game that they made was called Cut the Rope, right? And Cut the Rope came out in uh, October 2010, became number one hit success uh, on iOS. Uh, remind you that it was a time when, when only uh, a paid model was available, right? So 99 cents was the name of the game as um, previous speakers um, set, the, set the trend. Um, so we got 40 million installs in the first year. and. Um, we sat down and started thinking about what we do about uh, the success. What do we want to build a company? Um, and we looked at the various <clears throat> things around us to uh, identify and figure out what would be our DNA as a company. And we wanted to certainly make new games. That was in our blood. We said, look, okay, games is something we want to do. So what kind of games do we want to do? Um, if you think at the, at the, at the market, uh, really, 
<clears throat> from a global perspective, you have kind of three, three different um, approaches. I mean, one of them I would call popular genres, right? Something that already is known. Uh, some people call, call it cloning. I'd call it uh, finding uh, success sweet spots and where others also found success. We figured that this requires a really fast execution, uh, which Russian developers are just not good for. I mean, it's a cultural thing. So that was out of the question. Plus, we didn't want to do that, really. Um, second was licensing you know, Hollywood, pop culture, various games that, 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 that showed up because they uh, find a good license or really work with pop culture in a way that, that, that makes people click. Again, we <clears throat> are located in Russia. So it's kind of difficult for us to, A, uh, work with Hollywood, and B, really understand what's popular and what, what's going to be trendy. Uh, to really catch it. Same goes about pop culture, right? As much as we'd like to make a great trivia game or something, we just probably can't. It's, we don't have um, the same knowledge as people have that grew up in a, in a culture, right? It's very simple. So basically, original games was the number one uh, choice for us, and we decided to do this. And also, we immediately understood that education is really important, because if you don't really learn, uh, you're not going to succeed. It's, it's, it's flat, flat, simple. So we decided to um, attract different people from uh, technology, always works. Um, we decided to, that we really can't attract the top talent from all, all over the world, right? Because we're located in Moscow. Moscow is expensive, horrible weather, and people don't want to really, really want to move there, right? So. Uh, that means we need to grow our own people, right? Grow their competences. So we started bringing really advanced knowledge into the company by um, asking certain people from the industry to come and give us lectures and workshops and so on and so on and so forth. Plus, we um, obviously sponsor a bunch of events and, and uh, educational programs for our, for our employees. We really drained all the resources of the company to create this game, right? So, so, so in 2012, the company almost, you know, had a lot of problems because, because of the fact that, that we couldn't really make several games at the same time, right? It, it's just we couldn't figure out the proper way to do this, so, so our project managers were really draining resources from people, and, and um, we focused on making this game and releasing it. Um, at the time when we were releasing the game, we understood that the paid model was already dead. I mean, not dead, dead, but dying slowly. Uh, and we, we, at this point, we realized that while we found really interesting gameplay, we did not have a game that would monetize, right? I mean, we only had a chance to sell the game for 99 cents, which then we did. We, we did it, um, decided to release it on Christmas, because really, uh, in my view, it's the only time to release a paid title is Christmas, because that's when people really go to App Store when they get new devices. Anyway, it worked. It was a really successful, um, you know, created really positive ROI, but at the same time, it wasn't obviously you know, a big hit for us. So we've um, done our homework, and we decided to figure out what was wrong with our approach. And we said, look, in order for us to innovate, really, we need to create many, many projects at the same time. It's no longer in use how you do that, right? I mean, many people have told, told developers how you basically have a funnel, you put a lot of ideas in, and you shoot them along the way. So th we decided to take this approach. At the same time, that approach allowed us to make really small teams, like two, three people, basically indie developers within the company, or startups within the company, to work on the various projects. At the same time, Cutthroat 2 was created, uh, which again, we, we innovated in, in, in that. We decided the number two was a proper addition. So we you know, did really well with that game. And it's continued to grow. Because again, we, we're in Russia, right? And, and in Russia, we don't really have very many good MBA schools or people that have great experience running things, right? Because if you want to have a project team, you really need to have a mini CEO. Whatever you call them, general manager, somebody responsible for everything. Well, guess what? Like in Russia or in China, uh, same way. If, if you find somebody like that, they usually have their own company. Because there's so many opportunities, right? So if you're really good, you, you go and you run, run business yourself. So we decided to split responsibilities between game designer and a product manager, and a project manager. So kind of triad, triad of people running the gaming projects uh, was our answer to lack of you know, good general management. 
obviously we created regular pitches, brainstorms. We have a um, contest journal where people submit ideas. They win, they win prizes, iPads, and so on and so forth to funnel all those ideas in. So at the end, um, this is what it looks like. About 120 prototypes. Not prototypes, but concepts. Like simple, simple small concepts. 50 go into prototype stage. In various stages of development, you know, they get killed. Uh, five projects out of 50 go to soft launch, right? So we launched soft launched five projects, and we released one so far. Uh, it's called King of Thieves. It was released uh, on iOS February 12th. And I wanted to tell you about how we actually look at the process of developing games now based on King of Thieves. Um, so first soft launch, first iteration. Um, you see the numbers, right? I mean, we, it looked horrible. Retention was horrible, everything was horrible. It was a multiplayer game, and 60% of people haven't found a multiplayer, even though the bottom multiplayer was right there. 60% of people, we had, we had uh, somebody reviewed you know, video, uh, you know, sh shoot, shot the video on YouTube, let's play video, for 30 minutes and missed the multiplayer button. Amazing, right? Anyway, uh, we went forward. We started making different uh, additions to the game. So basically, we launched something that was really, really not a ready game. I mean, the graphics were not there. You know, the, lots of things weren't there. We were working on monetization along the way because there was just no recipe out there, right? I mean, how do you make a game where you combine a platformer and a, and a big multiplayer game? How do you do this, right? I mean, what kind of monetization model do you have to do, have? So anyway, all of this was experimenting, but we now were experimenting on live people. So we added um, several features, um, killed some. Uh, in our game, thieves used to die, they no longer die. Anyway, and at the fourth iteration of soft launch, and obviously different cohorts, we found sweet spot, we found LTV that that we, could, that we could run with. I mean, we set ourselves a very simple bar. Um, what will it take for us to release a game? Right? And we said, okay, LTV has to be this, retention has to be that. If it happens, we're, go, we're, going, to go, we're going, going to go to global launch. So that's exactly what happened. Um, we also decided that we want to look at different markets, obviously, I mean, and it's, it's no, no, no secret that China, Japan, Korea, sorry, mistake, uh, and, and India are markets that have their dif different rules, right? So first we decided, okay, we can't take all the markets at the same time, so let's start with China. So with China, uh, we have a local partner called Yodo One. So we really could develop the game with them as we went along. So our game was developing at the latest stages of soft launch. We gave the code to them. So made the different versions of the game. Um, as you can see, results were pretty good. Um, in China, just iOS, one first week, we got almost the same amount of downloads as we got in the entire world, which is pretty scary if you think about it. But hey, it's, um, it's China. It's a big market. We, as you can see, the game looked different. Uh, looks different. So the Chinese version at the top, you know, uh, the world version at the bottom. And, and as, thing go, as, as things go along, it will look even more different. I mean, things will change. Some of the interactions in China will be different from, from interactions in, in the rest of the world, uh, simply because there are lots of cultural differences that you have to think about. So we think the same, obviously, about Japan. Japan is an incredibly difficult market to crack. It's been said so many times. If you're not Japanese, you know, you come to me and you say, I have a great game for Japan. I don't know where you got it from. I have no idea. Um, but anyway, then we released the King of Thieves on Android. We, we gave two weeks delay because, you know, we released an iOS first. In two weeks, we got, um, we released Android, this time without China, because we learned so much on iOS launch that we decided that Android will be postponed to where, when we get the game to, to a better stage. Anyway, so um, Android, again, just some data for you, surprising places where you get the most downloads. You know, that's interesting, um, especially given the fact that we had absolutely zero marketing budget. I mean, well, we spent a little bit on PR, obviously, but the way, the way we 
really have done it is, is we started working with communities of people uh, even before the game launched. Uh, we started supporting community from, from the very, very beginning because the minute the, the, minute the game launched, we had like 200 tickets in, in, in our support system. And by the time uh, the game made through Thursday, we had even more. So we had to work on those. But the most important thing I want to tell you here is that today, global release is really a soft launch. I mean, if you're making something new, uh, you will never understand your real potential until you launch with a global audience or for big audience. Because soft launch is great, but once you launch to the entire world, I mean, all of a sudden you get people telling you a lot of things, right? We get data that you otherwise would never receive. Um, and so looking at this data, we immediately made one update, right? I mean, we said, OK, those are the things that are really wrong with the game. <laughs> Let's update them. People found some bugs that we couldn't find, and, we, and they called, called them super jumps. In our game, you can jump off the walls. And, and that was actually a bug. But people found it, and that was a feature. And there was some small portion of hardcore community that was really disappointed when we removed that bug. So it's working with, 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 with those people. But the most important thing here also is that there are about six months worth of features that we want to put in a game before we launch. So we decided that we're not going to do this. We decided that those six months will be chopped into one month intervals, and we're just going to do regular updates for people. Because that way, we'll make a game better. Right? Simple as that. I mean, we have now 10 million people that's played the game, downloaded it. You know, obviously, a lot less is left, but, but it's, you, know, you get the idea. So to summarize what I have said here is that if you want to innovate, and, and that's our recipe, right? You want to innovate, you want to make new games that have potential to be you know, the next whatever, the next something new. Then um, our approach is very simple. Um, as many ideas as possible. No idea is crazy. I mean, seriously. Like, King of Thieves came out of uh, con uh, Concord game, uh, parkour game, sorry. So we were thinking about parkour game, and that's how King of Thieves came alive. Go figure, right? Um, soft launch as soon as possible. Don't wait. I mean, MVP from minimal viable product really applies in games now even more than before. Because if a game has something in it, right, people will play it, and you will have retention. Retention is the number one approach. If the game doesn't have it, I mean, you'll see it with bad graphics, with great graphics. It doesn't matter really that much. So think of how you can launch the game as soon as humanly possible. And learn. Analytics, you know, it's been said by many people enough, but, but data. Data, data, data. Always look at the data and learn from experiences from other people. There are many blogs. I mean, uh, people tweet. There are good ideas you can get there. Um, and obviously, you know, there's always a little bit of luck. As the numbers of new games that enter app stores get really huge. You have to be a little bit lucky, as always. Anyhow, um, and what else are we doing as Zepta Lab? Um, so free-to-play is not the only way to make money. I mean, paid games still make money. I mean, we, we, we entered uh, top grossing uh, in in US and in 77 countries with um, Cutthroat 2 as a paid title. I mean, again, it's a big brand, and, and it's, and it's, and it's uh, difficult to, to, to replicate. But again, the way it works. I mean, we released uh, My Own Gnome, which is a simulator game, for $5. We removed all advertising, all in-apps, everything from it, because it's for kids. And people love this idea. I mean, they're like, OK, great, $5. You can only do it on Apple. You can't really do it on Android. Just, you know, but you can make money that way. Advertising is huge. I mean, 100% uh, of our Advertising, uh, advertising inventory in the United States is sold direct by direct partners. We don't sell to, to networks. So, and that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day. Networks are getting b better results. I mean, advertising is going to be a big business. It's already a big business, but it's getting even bigger. And obviously, because we have traffic and because we learned everything that we learned, we decided that we're going to publishing as well, right? I mean, we do it in a very soft manner. We don't have a um, big uh, division uh, that, that is assigned to that. But if you, get a, if you send a review, if you send a mail to review at Zeptalab with your game, um, it gets reviewed by our top people. 
and you get the response back. That's, that's our promise. We don't promise anything else, but we can promise that. As long as it's not complete nonsense, right? Just, just, so, we, just so we're clear. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you today. Uh, any questions? That was brilliant. That was really, really uh, deep. Lots of practical information I think is really useful. We've got time for kind of one question, so we're running a bit behind, but has anyone out there got a specific question they'd like to ask? Yes, gentleman in the blue shirt, here comes the mic. Hi, uh, can you tell us about your soft launch? How do you do, you know, what's the process of a soft launch actually? So, you know, I saw that you do multiple soft launch. Right. Uh, so yeah. It's, it's, it's fairly simple. You pick, you pick a certain territory yeah. and you call a game, I mean, and you launch your game just in that territory. We do it exclusively, I mean, we do it mostly on iOS because it's, it's easier to control. But on Android, you can do it faster because every time you don't have to wait to review for Apple testing, right? In our case, we actually called, even, even called the game differently. Uh, yes, so is it, is it called differently when you do a soft launch? Because once you do it, and the reviews, and you, know, it, it, you need to carry it forward, right? So, how, so do you do it with a, a pseudo name? Uh, we, we, did it, we did it in Canada. Uh, and and the, way, the way we did it, we called, we called the game differently. It was called Thieves. And we try to conceal that it was us, yeah. just just so we don't get uh, you know unneeded data from from the industry, right? So that way you get the clear data sample. And then all we did was just bought a little bit of traffic on Facebook. We did not do anything, no promotion, like that, right? So it never entered any charts or anything along those lines. It was really below. We spent a few hundred dollars, maybe a few thousand dollars total, just to buy you know a few thousand users. We looked at our numbers. Uh, every time we made a game change, we bought a little bit more users. So what's the benchmark for traffic? So you think 5,000 users is good enough, 10,000 users is good enough for, uh, for doing the soft launch? Or you look at a bigger, bigger data, bigger user base to do a soft launch? So, so, um, so where do you cut off? After how many users? I'm sorry? After how many users do you cut off? So do you, do you say that you need uh, 10,000 users to do a soft launch, nothing? No, you don't. I mean, okay. you, I mean in our case, we, we picked a few thousand. Okay. Because a few thousand, you know, 10,000, 100,000 is not going to give you a big difference in data. Millions will give you a big difference okay. in data. So, yeah, I mean, soft launch is, and you can do it with hundreds of people. It doesn't matter. Look, if you, like, and you look at retention, it's fairly simple. If a game is not designed for retention, find some interesting different model <laughs> to monetize it. But, 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 you know, you have to look at retention. Retention is not there, it's not there. Okay. Okay. On old people, on new people. All right, this is one super quick question. That's a very good answer. One, very quick. Yeah. How do you do testing on iOS? Android, it's pretty easy. You make a Google group, you release it as Cosmos on iOS. Apple at Max allows you to uh, have about 99 people per year to add and test it. So how do you, how do you test it? For example, you're saying 2,000 people, and you're looking at iOS first. How do you test And, and how do you check the results? I mean, what are your parameters to say, boom, good to go? Okay. Um, That's not a great question. <laughs> okay, I'll try to explain in a very, very simple stage. You, you open up your Apple developer tools. You submit your game to Apple. You just pick one country or two countries. That's it. There is no difference. Software. That's, that's soft launch. I mean, it takes some time for, for, for Apple to test your app. The difference with Android and Apple is that time. That's it. Then. You know, how do you look at data? I mean, how do you buy users? Well, you go buy ads on Facebook or somewhere else you want to buy them. Doesn't matter, right? I mean, you tell your friends to download the game. You get a certain amount of users. You have internal analytics, which, you know, can be very, very complex in our case, but it can be very simple when you look at retention. And if your retention parameters are not, we said, look, we need 45% first day, uh, and we hit it in the third iteration, I think, of soft launch or fourth. So, and then it went up from there. Uh, so we decided that for our game, 45% would be good because you know, we looked at mid-core games and their percentages and you know, basically internet, uh, uh, information available readily on the internet, and that's where we got our number from. That's it. Fantastic. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, so we've got to keep on, but you, you can grab him afterwards. We just can do a quick selfie, because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> applause, please. Loads of amazing data there, so definitely grab hold of me sure and, and get some more information. Um, next up, we've got a panel. It's a lovely chairs. And, and to, um, I'd like to hand back to uh, Reliance Games CEO Manish, who's going to 
from a panel looking at the gatekeepers of the app stores. So great guys, I have a really nice panel here. Uh, the most sought after people on the, on the globe which you will find for the game developer as far as they're concerned. Uh, the, the, the quarterate would have been complete with Apple they're also here, but I guess um, they, don't. <laughs> <laughs> they, do, they don't want to be on the stage. I'm sure they are in the conference, Chris would, would tell you how the ways to identify them and you can catch hold of Apple guys. But here is, uh, we have Google, Amazon, and Windows. Uh, our developer, as developer, I can tell you uh, that the starting point is uh, how to really get your game showcased on app stores. What we're going to quickly talk about is the India opportunity and the global opportunity. Sitting in India, how do we kind of leverage that? And without much ado, I will request my panelists to just quickly tell the company so that people know whom to uh, chase after this <laughs> panel. Yeah. And uh, then we will kind of get into the discussion. Wonderful. Uh, Sandeep from Microsoft. And uh, yes, as Manish Rail said, you can absolutely talk to me uh, after the session as well in terms of anything on Windows. I'll be the point of corner going forward. Hello, Michael Hines. I'm here from Seattle in the Amazon App Store. I'll be here today and tomorrow. Look forward to meeting you. Hi, everyone. I'm Kunal from Google Play. I run partnerships for India, Southeast Asia, and Australia. Happy to chat up with you during this session as well as later. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, guys. I, I, I have. Yeah. yeah. So there are two ways I can do this. I have some questions, but I'm sure all these questions will be common, what you're going to ask. So do you want to start with the Q&A? What, what do you suggest? We start? OK, guys. So my job is very easy. I have to just ask questions. Yeah. So a uh, couple of things which are as a developer on, on, on everybody's mind. Uh, how do I really start to reach out to you guys? How do I even showcase my game? I think that's the first point. If, you, if just quick perspective on what, what is your suggestion? What's the best way on as an indie developer? How can I really reach out to you guys? Um, I'll go ahead and take a shot at that. On the developer.amazon.com/welcome <coughs> developer portal, um, beneath uh, the pages, there is always a contact us link. And I have the good fortune of sitting in the same floor as the real human beings who actually read all of those messages. Now, you don't always get a real human being responding to you, uh, particularly if the message is not really appropriate or it doesn't have an actionable item. But real human beings actually do read that, and that's the best way to get in touch with us because they know how to send it to the right place. So, Ronald? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, a good starting point is uh, developer.android.com. I think that gives you all the right instructions. Um, the site is hopefully uh, well aligned to what you're looking for. So typically it has various sections on designing an app, developing, distributing, and monetizing. Uh, and it, all has, it has all the right links to, for example, the developer console, which you can use to actually create an account and start publishing. So yeah. developer.android.com is the go-to resource to begin with. Yep. Wonderful. Um, on the Windows side, it's devwithwindows.com. Uh, as a company, we are going through transformation. So you would see a lot of uh, you know, unification happening on Windows as a platform with Windows Phone and Windows a desktop. So devwithwindows.com in the one-stop shop. Uh, it's a platform convergence story right now. So you would see uh, uh, resources available for any platform across the board in terms of form factors, but Windows Phone or, or Windows uh, Desktop, or whatever say. And uh, that's one-stop shop. So be it Windows 10, Windows 8.1. It's one stop shop, devredwindows.com. So what, I, what do I do? I've done all this, which you guys have told, and I've not heard. You're not what? I've not heard from, from the real person sitting there. I've done all this, which you have told me, contacted, put, uploaded, and, and all that stuff. So is there, is there any recourse which I can have after that, or it's a lost case for me? So look, I think it really starts with uh, with, with the ability. So the the, go, the whole platform, which is uh, developer or Android .com, as well as the developer console, are designed to make sure that you have the right set of tools, templates, uh, self service solutions to even start publishing. Sure. And there are there are opportunities for you to actually flag off, escalate issues if you have any. So there are forms, for example, if you if you're facing any any issues around, say, a policy question, right, or a policy violation, or you think that there is a question that you have around IP, you can flag that off to us, sure. and somebody will certainly get back to you. Um, so so I, think, I think, like I said, most of the tools are already available through the developer sure. console for you to, to flag off. What are, uh, moving on to the next one, if, as, what are the kind of things which you have seen on your respective platforms which really lead to engagement uh, in monetization? What are the couple of 
best practices if you could really kind of if there are any yeah no there are i think i think there's a lot of work which has happened i can clearly speak uh, from the standpoint of google play here uh, if you look at specific best practices i think there are lots to do, to look at specifically around the way that the game has been designed uh, and promoted so i think if i if i broadly look at the key buckets right any any developer any any sort of publisher is really looking at three core areas where they need help uh, the help around actually creating the the game and making sure the right specs and quality aspects are being adhered to that moves on from creating a game to actually distributing it so that's where google play comes in and making sure that you have the right opportunity to publish in the markets that you have at the right prices that you want and then moving on to engagement now engagement specifically is a big area i'm sure all of you have i've like, heard enough about the fact that really success lies in in making sure that users are coming back and playing again and and that opens up and unlocks the whole monetization opportunity yes. for you right so i think on that specifically there are a bunch of things that you could do for example making sure that you are using tools such as google play game services to have things like achievements leaderboards etc uh, so that your users remain engaged uh, making sure that you are using the right set of icons uh, description uh, just simple things like assets videos that you're using to actually promote the game very interesting. Uh, so those are very very interesting and simple things that you can do to make sure that people keep on coming back is, uh, sorry is there some kind of a diary or a google play best practices something which you guys have or you plan? Yeah. yeah absolutely so very recently we launched something called uh, the secrets to success on google play so no longer a secret uh, the the booklets are actually available at the booth here as well so sure. in case you haven't picked up your copy please do that uh, whenever you get some time it's a pretty interesting compilation of of the 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 core things that you should look out for while developing designing and distributing your game uh, and and getting and getting users to engage and monetize. So I would strongly Perfect. encourage that you look at that uh, guide. That's great, Mike. What we found is that applications need to um, have three things to be a minimum viable product. One that will actually survive in the marketplace and put food on your table. They need to have a really good game loop. Uh, you touched on quality, fun to play. Those are all really critical things. Two, they need to have a good monetization loop. You need to decide if you're building a game in India for the rest of the world or in India for India because you may make different choices in your monetization options in your monetization loop and then the third thing was to the question that you asked earlier which is around engagement uh, and user and, and, and getting users in uh, there are three things I've noticed that make the absolute biggest difference in the games that do well on the Amazon App Store first regular content updates is really super important without that even a super popular game like uh, Monuments, um, you guys have seen that I think, uh, can really take a nosedive without really good regular content updates. Two, you gotta add social to your game. Even if it's as simple as um, a, a silly leaderboard or an achievements board that you can share on Facebook, you gotta add social to keep people bragging and talking about your game to start acting as advocates for your game and bringing other people in. The the third thing is absolutely brilliant. It's combining number one and number two and getting user-generated content into your game. Think Minecraft or Trivia Crack. And that really amps up engagement because now people have a stake in your game. They have a vested interest in what you're doing. And that's really going to nail that, that acquisition and user retention third of a minimum viable product. Wonderful. I think if there's a checklist, I think gentlemen have spoken about eight of them. Um, <laughs> Uh, one thing which stands out for us, um, you know, uh, from from Windows is you no know, differentiation. Uh, quality is there for sure, but end of the day, uh, you have to embrace the local tenets of the platform. I think that what would drive much more engagement in terms of that form factor. Uh, quality is, is again very subjective. You know, end of the day, uh, one thing I can say openly here is if you have a quality game, come to us. We'll help you, you know, make it popular. That's something which you can watch for any day. But end of the day, it's about quality and embracing the local design tenets of the platform. That would probably take you further. Can you elaborate on that further? What do you mean? Yeah. By that? For example, if you look at Windows, I can talk about Windows and I can talk about you know, other platforms also. But um, there are certain ways in which users use that particular operating system, right? For example, if it's social, uh, if it's an app bar for that matter, and one platform comes on the top, it comes on the bottom of the platform. Now, end of the day, if you are trying to make sure it's it's a seamless experience or same experience across all the platforms, users users tend to not to use not users tend to forget that feature, and probably you would not get any use of that feature because it's not. Put 
competition in the right place because it's in a different place or different platform and on, 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 on this platform you 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 assuming that users will discover that discoverability is a bigger challenge there and hence you have to embrace local design tenets local design philosophies and and that would probably stand out taking sorry you want to say that yeah, just just to, uh, to just to add on to the quality aspect and the localization, I think one thing which is extremely critical, I think no matter how many games and apps sort of start appearing, whether it's million to million, the fact is a relentless focus on quality is something which is which is absolutely the need of the art. And for that specifically, there are two things that I want to call out. Uh, I think there was a discussion, brief discussion about beta testing and sort of soft launches and all of that. I think that is super critical. Um, there are tools available right now to make sure that you that you are able to test your games uh, with, with within a closed group, get some early feedback, get reports on crashes, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that before you actually scale up and roll out, uh, the, the risk of failure gets minimized. The other important thing is something known as staged rollouts, for example. So whenever you have new updates coming up, rather than launching to everybody at the same time, you can look at targeting a progressively higher percentage of your existing user base through staged rollouts, and that again minimizes the risk of failure, get, helps you get seek feedback very quickly early on, and, and therefore helps you localize and improve quality as well. So th those are two important things that I that I definitely wanted to stress upon. Yeah, yep. in fact, Mike. just on that note, <laughs> our effort is, when, when, when you said, you know, you have to look at, there is definitely volume in, 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 in Google, honestly, that's something which is phenomenal. So our effort is when you release, you release it for all one in one shot, is has been our push. So just, just to, you know, uh, uh, it is on, on a jovial note, just wanted to pass on that comment. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you guys a quick question really fast. How many of you guys use A-B testing in your games currently? Okay, a handful. That's actually good. That's more than the last good. group I talked to. A-B testing is super important, particularly if you've got analytics that measure things like level abandonment. So there's level completion. There's, you know, complete can be a pass or a fail. And then there's level abandon. Oftentimes, level abandoning can be a problem that's going to result in losing users and you're going to have acquisition problems and retention problems. A-B testing can be used to change the difficulty or other levers you have in your game, and you can maximize that. You can, you can use A-B testing to optimize for level completes. And if you can optimize for level complete and new level starts, you're on a really good track to uh, optimizing your user retention. But you've got to be using the right tools. Um, you know, certainly Google, Amazon, and I think Microsoft all have uh, access to free A-B testing APIs that you can implement. As a matter of fact, you guys right now, before the day is over, can take about a two hours and implement an A-B test that will test different buttons, different text on a, on a purchase button, for example. You guys could do that before you leave today. There's no reason not to. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Sandeep, your point uh, in terms of OAS and OAS-specific thing and platform-specific thing, one of the common things which I hear from my fellow developer community is difficulty of porting to Windows. Okay. Uh, and that's why that's one of the kind of barrier mm -hmm. for people to really kind of even if they're creating games on Unity or Cocos or, or yeah. they are really shy of doing it. Do you, do you think that's the that's a reality or it's a myth? And if yeah, I, I think it it was a reality till 12 months back. Okay. Uh, not anymore. Uh, we definitely accept the fact that earlier there was no Unity didn't support Windows for a long time, and and. Jan last year is when the support started, and I think since then we've seen a lot of popular games being ported to Windows seamlessly. And uh, from portable standpoint, in fact, uh, at, at, on Microsoft we have this philosophy called Unicel Windows Apps, Unicel Apps, which which is supposed to be running across multiple form factors, irrespective of whether it's iOS and Android. Now Unity supports Unicel Windows Apps. That way, there's absolute support on the platform for Unity and, and other players as well. So today, uh, it's it, it's 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 reality in terms of you can absolutely port for Windows seamlessly without any problem. Great. Mike, a question for you. Uh, any Android game, can it really seamlessly get on Amazon? I'm sorry, repeat the question? Any game which has been made for Google Play, can it be ported or launched on the Amazon App Store? Uh, just about. As a matter of fact, 70%, 75% of the apps uh, made for Google Play when submitted to the Amazon App Store just work with no additional developer effort required. The one thing we don't do is support Google Play APIs. So um, we do a pretty good job of mirroring, um, say, Maps version one, but we don't have the geofencing in um, uh, Google Play's uh, Maps version two. So if your game relies on geofencing, it's not going to work. 
for in-app purchasing, we have uh, an Amazon in-app purchasing API that's pretty easy to swap with Google's in-app purchasing API. Um, other than that, everything else just works. Wow. So essentially, if I'm a developer making games for Google Play, I could really put it on Amazon and unlock my value. Um, all you have to do is take your Google Play APK, drag and drop it over to a testing tool on developer.amazon.com, welcome. And it'll tell you if it's ready to go or if it's not ready to go, it'll tell you what you need to change in order to make it ready. Um, usually you can get it done in less than two days uh, if there is anything wrong. Right. Put on a question for you. Yeah. Uh, what would be your advice for the developer to really look at a game from an India point of view now, or India and global, or only global? What would your two cents would be on that? So great question. So I think there are two things that we need to look out for. Now, whether you're developing for users in India or, or users outside, I think one thing remains constant. The constant there is quality and, and making sure that you're using the right set of best practices that we spoke about, uh, beta testing, stage rollouts, uh, quality of the icon, quality of the description, keywords, all of those things. So those, those, stay, those are golden rules wherever yeah, you go. Yeah, one must have. Right. right. Yeah. The other big part is really around localization. Right. So I think it's very, very important to get the local nuances right. So for example, if you are a developer building uh, games for, say, the Japanese market, right, uh, you know that the Japanese uh, users love dragons and all of that. So, so, so if, you, if you see the, the app stores, if you, if you see the, the stores in Japan, clearly you'll see a huge spike in terms of the number of icons which have dragons and those sorts of characters. Contrast that to a place like Korea, where they love cute characters. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and contrast that to the US where it's a combination. Right. So, so I think it's, it's very important for, for you as a developer to understand the local flavor um, and sort of customize that. If you're developing for Southeast Asia, for, for, for that matter, and looking at a market like Indonesia, they love football, they have a deep sense of community, everything that they do there is very community driven. So the, the, app, the app quality, description, videos, all of that need to sort of connote that that aspect of your... Are there examples of games which have transcended geographies and have been successful across without the sensibilities of art sensibilities being changing so dramatically across the right. geographies? No, I, th I think Glue did a good job. I think, I think they did a pretty good job of using different sort of graphics, uh, icons, descriptions for different markets that they actually operated in. So that's a pretty good, interesting example to look at. Even Leo's Fortune, I think, a uh, yeah, big global name, I think they, they've done a pretty good job of localizing um, to different markets. So I think that local Localization is critical, and getting that cultural nuance right is, is something that we need to look at. So from Mike, your perspective, uh, Amazon offers a global opportunity um, in, a, in a much, much larger scale compared to India, or it's like equal opportunity for a developer? What, what's the scene? So a developer in India can choose to make a, a market available globally. We're available in 236 countries and territories worldwide. Uh, or you can make an app specifically for India. Uh, one of the things that I would add um, to what you've just said is to make sure that you've thought about the, the regional monetization opportunities. For example, in Europe and in North America, almost everybody has a credit card connected to their App Store account, and in-app purchases are really very seamless that way. Not so much in a lot of the Asian markets you may want to address, or in the India market, where carrier billing is considerably more um, prevalent. With carrier billing, uh, certainly Google and Amazon have had their challenges getting carrier billing up and running. So if you're developing an application that you want to start monetizing in India today, start thinking about using ads as a primary method of monetization. So one, you do need to be regionally appropriate in the game that you've designed in the user interface, but also in the monetization loop and monetization strategy. I think that's a great point because for whatever reasons you guys, whenever you guys will get a carrier billing and there'll be a banner from heaven for developers on your app stores. But till that time, I think uh, having ads as a core loop is the solution, and I think that's what we are kind of figuring out in India and, and developers have to do. And I'm confident saying that we're both working really hard on that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing that, and I want to, want to get that time. Uh, Sandeep, what's your perspective on Windows? What's the opportunity globally and in India? Yeah, I think just to um, uh, tee off from where Mike spoke about operator building, I think with, in India we've done it with IDEA, and uh, after which we've seen significant uh, updates, you know, increase in terms of transactions, because that's easy for anybody to you know, purchase games. Um, and, and opportunity, absolutely. If you look at today, uh, you know, first of all, you know, I have to acknowledge the fact that as a company, as a platform, there, there is a little bit of struggle in terms of, hey, you know, how can we get the share? Right? So one is value versus volume. 
And, and that's where we're trying to strike a balance. There is a player which is absolutely on the high volume. There is a player in terms of value. And, and we are stuck in, in terms of you know, balance between value and volume. Uh, I would say with Windows 10, uh, I can answer the question in terms of the current market, but probably it's, 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 it's more relevant, exciting in terms of when Windows 10 hits the road, which is a few months away. You would probably see uh, 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 an opportunity in terms of build once and run across multiple form factors, right from Windows Phone to Windows 8 desktops, I would say Windows 10, to Xbox and any other form factors that, that hits the road. So uh, opportunities, absolutely. Today, you know, uh, if you look at mobile operating billing itself, uh, we're in about uh, you know, 42 countries with 80 mobile operators. Uh, you know, that's the type we have. Uh, after which you've seen literally you know, 8x increase in, in, in usage in terms of transaction on a monthly basis. Very nice. Um, so I would say we're in the di right direction. I think all of us want to absolutely get there in terms of making sure it's, seam it's seamless for anybody to purchase games. Uh, our effort is on. And uh, all I can say is, you know, exact times ahead. So, uh, one of the things Microsoft has done that I really like is what you're doing with Developer Studio and partners like Xamarin. Uh, using Xamarin and Developer Studio, I can use C Sharp, I can use Java, I can write in whatever language I want, I can get an APK spit out for Android, I can get um, uh, an Apple binary, I can, uh, then of course I can submit to all of the Windows 10 devices. So using development, I don't work for Microsoft by the way, I work for Amazon. <laughs> um, using, using Developer Studio and Xamarin, um, you really can and start to develop for everything. So it's going to, you know, it's going to be something that Unity people um, uh, can take another look at too. Absolutely. I can see you can Thanks, never Mike. take a Microsoft out of Excel. <laughs> yeah. So great, guys. Uh, last last question. Uh, you, you have seen India market very closely. You have seen what is going to, what what kind of games genres. Is there any kind of two three genres which come to your mind which typically Indian consumers love for high engagement, which uh, which, which which you want to kind of talk about? from your own analysis of games which have done very well in India? Um, honestly, cricket is one. I think gaming, right? So uh, one, one trend I've seen recent past is they're gamifying everything. It's not about, hey, it's a game, but even if I have to teach children, you know, A, B, C, D, they're gamifying that. That's something which is working really well. And number two, localization, right? In terms of my mother is a big you know, game freak, but she says, hey, when, where can I see a game in Canada, which is a local language? Uh, I would say... I think it's a great point. Yeah, so I would say that's, that's where uh, big bucks are there, I guess, in terms of you know, how we can monetize in a big way. Opportunity exists, the question of, hey, are we assessing the market in the right way? Can we reach out to uh, not just 20, 25 in age group wherein they, they're game freaks, even 10-year-olds, but how about the larger group wherein smartphones are use, being used by 45 years and old, uh, you know, plus people in a bigger way? How do we reach right. the 5 to 65? Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. That's the... And across the pubs, right? I, cross yep. I think that's a great point. Mike, do you want to kind of... Um, I'll let you go first. So from a, cat from a category standpoint, I think uh, uh, casual games and, and education basis, so she just said about learning and, and education based games, I think they are, they have a pretty bright future. Uh, and from a device standpoint, I think it's still early days, but we are pretty bullish on, um, on some of the newer form factors. So I think Android TV. Uh, as well as, um, of course, tablets are, are already growing, uh, and to a certain extent, even wearables. I think there'll be a lot of opportunity which will come up on all these other different form factors going forward in India. So watch out for that. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a great yeah. perspective. Um, education, absolutely. Uh, if you're building games for India, your market spends more on education than any other country that I'm aware of. It, uh, education spending is higher than healthcare spending in a lot of tier one cities. It's really surprising when you, when you take a look at that. So education apps are huge. Also our media apps, apps that stream media from around the country that stream sporting events. And that's I think why one, one of the reasons that we're both seeing uh, things like um, uh, Chromecast and, and Amazon TV uh, really kind of pick up on those different form factors because that video, that media consumption is a is a big component of the market. Yep. Uh, with that, I would like to ask questions from the audience. Yes, I can see your hand. I just want to see if there is any other hand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no bias. We just want to look at some other guys. Yes, there. Yeah. Okay, can we have the mic, please? We can we grab one. Oh. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll come back to the back after him. Hello. Uh, can you tell us some best practices for surfacing our new game on the stores? Like, what do you feel? 
I, I knew that question is going to come. <laughs> and you get stuck with Mike. <laughs> I have to, so I've got to go first, yeah. So I think, I think look, the best, the, some of the best practices are pretty simple, straightforward. Um, getting the store listing right is extremely critical, right? And, and that store listing has a number of different components that you need to watch out for. So the kind of icons you're using, the, the description, uh, making sure that you're not spamming the user with multiple keywords, uh, making sure that you have a relentless focus on monitoring ratings and reviews, and that you're responding to those ratings and reviews. So I think these are some of the important signals that we take into account for making for surfacing the right con content. Uh, so I think it's extremely important to do that. Um, the other important thing, uh, specifically from a discoverability standpoint, is engagement. Um, Broadly speaking, there are four important signals that you need to look at, which the algorithms uh, clearly for play definitely look at as far as uh, surfacing content is concerned. One is number of installs, so that's important. Number of uninstalls is equally important, right? So I think it's very important to make sure that people are actually finding that content relevant and they are engaged with it and they're not just sort of downloading and uninstalling because that sort of goes against you. Uh, the other big piece is actually ratings and reviews. So, like I said, making sure that through the console you are re relentlessly reviewing and responding to users and taking action uh, will definitely help your cause. So I think the asset best practices, which are around icon, description, keywords, all of that, along with the constant user engagement, uh, along some of the principles that I just mentioned, will really help. Um, I'll tell you a, a personal experience. Um, I wrote a, over the weekend uh, some time ago, I wrote just a simple little quotes app. And I would have loved to have responded to user questions and, and reviews, except I didn't get any. As a matter of fact, I didn't get any downloads at all from my own store with my little quote app. Um, now, granted, I didn't do any thought about marketing or keywords. And it turns out my quote app, which was about early American history, and there are a lot of like George Washington um, um, Adams quotes in there. So what I did was I added keywords for Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Adams, so that when people were looking for those kinds of American history things, my quotes app would show up uh, based on the keywords that I put in my product description. That got a lot of downloads, even more when I went to Twitter and did hashtag founding fathers and told everyone at that hashtag, hey, I've got this great new quotes app that has a lot of stuff that you might be interested in. Now I'm making about $10 a month on this stupid little app I wrote over the weekend, and I'm starting to get reviews, and he could not be more right. Absolutely engage the people who are taking the time to review and write comments about your product. These are people who have invested in your product and making it better. Not engaging with them is telling them you don't care about them. You can turn these people into your advocates. You can turn players into fans simply by acknowledging that they've got good points and telling them what you can do or, or telling them that you've addressed some of their problems. Great, great suggestion. Do you want to add on, Sandeep? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the gentleman who spoke in the previous session, uh, I think uh, he's, yeah, he spoke about, uh, you know, soft launch, right? I think if you want to surface up your app, I think I've not seen many do soft launch in India, right? In terms of, you know, be it preview or, or trying to understand uh, or, or address all the points you guys mentioned and then do a big bang launch. I think that's something which would probably definitely make a difference in terms of surfacing up your app uh, in a big way. Yeah, so Last question, guys, at the back. Sorry, Knan. Yeah, no, I, th I think uh, the beta testing is a pretty, pretty interesting, uh, similar, similar to a soft launch, right? Where you're identifying the key sets of uh, users, yeah. and it's very important to get that group right, guys. So again, making sure that you have representation from different handset types, different markets, different bandwidth that people are actually using the, those phones on. So it's very important to get that initial set of beta testers right. And, and so I would strongly encourage you to spend some time uh, investing in some time in, in, in building that right user base for beta testing uh, so that you get the right quality feedback. So it's, it's, I think that's, that's time well spent. Last question, and these guys are here. So yeah. Uh, hi, Kunal. My, uh, I'm Akshay from Froley Games. My question is about price points. Is Google Play looking to reduce a minimum price point for India? Because what we would like is, you know, if I go out and buy a cup of tea, I spend five, ten rupees. I want a guy who can afford to buy a cup of tea to be able to spend that money and play for another ten days or five hours. Good question. Good question, actually. So that is something which 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 is constantly under review, 
uh, and that is also being reviewed in relation to the number of uh, forms of payment that we currently have, right? So, so the two need to be looked at in conjunction with each other, and and uh, uh, there is there is some progress that we're now trying to make finally with with things like gift cards and with 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 carrier billing. Uh, so hopefully we will have we will have uh, good news soon. But yes, like I said, those two things are being viewed in in conjunction. So will we see it in 2015, 2016? Or Let's hope. <laughs> don't, don't, okay. uh, Let's don't, hope don't push. That's, that's a wrong one. You got okay. the answer you wanted. Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, thank you very much. These gentlemen are here. Uh, sorry, you can catch him. Sally is giving me very dirty looks. So. Okay. I'm, I'm scared. Yeah. So, time out for us. Thank you very much. And thank you, guys. Thank you. Really, really useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.